Anwar Datur, Ibrahim, it's such a pleasure having you with us uh, at uh, the Raisna Dialogues. And I just heard a most scintillating speech from you, really concluding this session, this entire conference, where we were assembled to discuss the world reorder. And you made some very pertinent points there. You were speaking about the end of history becoming history itself, uh, the end of uh, the era of a Western-led model of globalization, to which the challenge actually came not from any revisionist states or even the Al-Qaeda. It came from within the Western democracies themselves. And you spoke at length about it. Now, my question is that what do you see emerging out of this? There is uh, this whole question of a new order emerging. Is there an Asian way forward? Is there an Asian ethic which you spoke about, which you can create for this new order? You see, we need to uh, persuade the ruling establishment and the elites to have the courage to think outside the box. The solution need not necessarily be confined to our understanding of capitalism or globalization as in the past. Capitalism has ignored, it is still important, it has important ingredients, but it has ignored the issue of inequality, grinding poverty, the loss of moral and ethical values. Uh, similarly, with the whole talk about global, globalization, pandering to the Western agenda. Uh, I'm not necessarily pro-East or anti-West, but I think the way forward is a strong ethical and moral dimension, which Asia need to help promote. And India has this unique sort of as a microcosm of Asia and the world to be able to um, resurface and reignite this slowly uh, losing uh, support or uh, base on the issues of, again, religious values, not in the uh, blatant uh, doctrine sense, but in the values that we all promote. Uh, you say India, I would also say Malaysia. Now, Malaysia is May 2018, a spectacular election result. You know, democracy on the move, transformations happen, and Malaysia somehow again poised to become the kind of a liberal state. No, a liberal democratic state, an open uh, where, where rule of law prevails. That is what you're really striving towards in this country. At the same time, if you look around ASEAN, you know, you've had elections in Cambodia, where you had uh, a single party rule virtually being reestablished all over again. So when we talk about countries like India and Malaysia, when you talk of democracy and the Asian model of democracy, what what is it? Do you think that this becomes the basis for a, a new kind of an ethic? You see, political scientists in the West talk about fragility of democracy. Developing countries have no capacity to understand and comprehend the intricacies of democratic values, and particularly the Muslim countries, which has clearly deficit in issue of governance and democracy. But I think Malaysia, thank God, has succeeded because it is inclusive. We are a majority Muslim country, but if you could look at the support base, we have phenomenal support from the Indian, ethnic Indians, ethnic Chinese, and the indigenous tribes. So they owe it. It is not uh, the ruling clique. Because I always say, even in the prison, my prison war, the years I had to contemplate under, in, during solitary confinement, I always believe that, come on, um, they, we must trust in the wisdom of the masses. They may be deemed to be semi-literate in an in intellectual sense, but they know what the right value. They know what is corruption, what is oppression, what is poverty. You know? and, and I think these are the values between right and wrong. And I think these are I mean, intrinsic, and they have to have then the confidence in the um, uh, political leadership which is also losing its uh, glamour in terms of um, because of the disillusionment uh, and, and the failure of political leaders to uphold these values. 
and I think, I mean, I don't think it is purely Malaysian because in my personal experience, I benefited immensely from interaction with other civilizations, other countries. And of course, India was one of the first uh, countries that I fell in love with. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let me now move on to a slightly different dynamic here. Let us look at uh, the last EPIC conference. Uh, there was, and even during this Raisna dialogue, there's been repeated talk about a new Cold War emerging. And the actors in the Cold War being, on the one side, the United States, on the other side, China. So for countries in Asia, this question of a choice, if it is posed as a choice, when you start a Cold War as to which side are you on, how do Asian countries navigate this? Who dictate the narrative of this new dialogue? It cannot be Washington DC or Europe. I mean, we should dictate ourselves. Among our countries in Asia, who knows China better than India and the neighboring countries? Yes, we have some differences, fair, uh, not only uh, with China, but also with our neighboring countries. I am, I am a firm believer in democracy, the rule of law. Uh, I have suffered immensely because of op oppression, denial of my basic right. I am not prepared to compromise. But we are dealing with other countries, other civilizations, other cultures. And, and I think we need to continue to engage with China, engage with the United States. Not in the terms of any of these countries. We have learned uh, the excesses that we found, but I don't share this view of the Cold War, of the new emerging uh, Cold War. The trade war is between the United States and China. But don't drag us into and compel us to consider this as a new Cold War. I do not share it. And I think uh, in my exchanges, however limited, I mean, with Prime Minister Nanda Modi, with uh, Duterte of the Philippines or Jokowi with Indonesia, in my limited uh, exchanges after I was released from prison, I didn't sense that uh, same view as we see the narrative out in the open between China and the United States. Yet there are certain concerns. Uh, for example, uh, Malaysia had to step in and cancel projects such as the ECRL. Uh, on perhaps grounds for which had more to do with Malaysian systems. Uh, but that does raise the question as to this larger project of Asian integration, which is actually everyone's ideal. There is a Chinese-led project of Asian integration. Are there other alternative projects which dovetail into this or build this up to a larger idea of a complete unified Asian integration project, which is not China-centric? Mm. I agree, uh, but specifically the need to review some of the uh, announced projects uh, in the past in Malaysia, and not because of the Chinese, but because it was the way it was done. Um, it is not again China necessarily, but certainly major Chinese companies. And we can ill afford, we thought the charge was exorbitant, and we are dealing with a new government, more accountable, more transparent, and in no way can we defend the perceived excesses of the past. So um, this uh, Prime Minister Mahade explained, and I went and met a number of uh, leading Communist Party leaders to explain that, look, we want better relations trade, but we cannot uh, be deemed to be condoning the excesses of the past, because uh, the public, Malaysians, uh, supported us uh, insisting on transparency and rule of law. And, and coming to the issue of, of uh, Chinese companies, they can proceed, of course. But uh, my appeal to the Indian leaders, for example, is to be also uh, more aggressive in trade, investments, uh, and, and also some issues on freedom and uh, justice, because India is seen to be the beacon hope in terms of uh, freedom, justice, democratic values, but 
uh, I would add the issue of investments and uh, trade because then it would give countries, smaller countries like Malaysia or within ASEAN an opportunity to grow not totally dependent on any particular, particular country. So you had meetings with Prime Minister Modi today. Uh, what do you see as the future of uh, the bilateral relationship between India and Malaysia? Well, uh, we have had uh, excellent bilateral relations, it's true, and even under previous governments uh, in Malaysia, previous governments in India. Um, but as I said to the Foreign Minister and also Prime Minister Modi, uh, the threshold is so low, so it, is imp it has improved too gradually. But I think um, uh, now that uh, we have this um, desire from both countries, uh, to push uh, so that trade and, and trade or investments and uh, education cooperation research uh, even cultural I mean a special emphasis in culture because I don't believe we can talk about ethics and values minus culture yes. I don't think that we, we should talk about economic empowerment without cultural empowerment so and I think uh, this is where uh, one area that we really need to explore. So Asian countries basically need to be more ambitious about Asia and about themselves. It's true. I mean, of course, they have to be realistic yes. at the same time. But uh, I think ambitious in the sense that they must move beyond the old paradigm. Yeah. And I think uh, people must think that's why I'm, I just provoke the idea that, you know, you shouldn't be tied to the old capitalist outlook. Uh, you, you must not think the way many in the West think that there is no concern for religious values. I mean, we are Asians. Um, we are not fanatics. Uh, we don't denigrate other religions. But to me, um, Chinese values, um, ethical, moral, is still relevant in uh, econo politics and the economy and culture. Uh, that's why I, I use this quote by Gandhiji on what's politically correct and uh, cannot be morally wrong, what is morally right cannot be politically wrong. It sounds like a cliche nobody believes in because of the erosion of ethical values. Thank you so much, Dr. Shri Anwar Ibrahim, for being with us on this Facebook Live session. It's been great having you at the Rice Now Dialogues, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.